as far as you can see. And they all have bandages on their eyes and they all had cataract surgery. From start to finish, children who you know were blind because of the cataracts, elders, and there was a mission trip there. Believe it or not, it was just a medical mission. It probably wasn't a Christian mission. And it showed when the bandage was removed and the people could see, and what did they do? They went over to the wall with a picture of their president or their you know, leader is, and they bowed themselves down and they get, thanked him for their healing. They thanked him for their provision, they, which they have nothing. But they worshiped him. They don't know God. We are blessed. I just wanted to share that with you. I want you to know that we here are just part of a huge body of Christ. What we see here isn't the end all. And we need to pray and remember the brothers and sisters in bondage. I have here um, Voice of the Martyrs. It was from February. It tells about your brothers and sisters in North Korea. There's hundreds and hundreds of them in work camps. They die daily from the beatings, from the starvation, but they stand for Christ. Remember how good we have it. I have one here. Um, it's an, these are older issues, but they'll show you different countries, how they live and their needs. Our body of Christ is bigger than this, this body right here. I just have a burden for missions Pastor said something the other day about there's a, there's a statistic or a word that says that when this generation passes, nobody will be giving to missions. God uses us to sustain those people. If we don't give from what God gives us, if we hold it back because maybe we won't have a vacation if we give what God puts on our heart to give, or maybe we won't you know, be able to go to the amusement park with our kids in the summer if we give that amount that God had put on our hearts to give. But you'll never outgive God. Let go of what you're holding on to. Give to missions and teach your children to give to missions. When we were kids, they used to say to us, finish what's on your plate. There's people starving in the world. I never hear that anymore, do we? We don't hear it. Isn't that what our mothers used to tell us? Don't throw that bread away. There's kids starving. It's true. It's true. And I, I waste a lot of food. I, I, I'm guilty, too. But I, um, we need to be mindful, and we need to be givers. And, and I just wanted to share that with you today. Please, next week, or this week is supposed to be Mission Sunday. It's second Sunday of every month. And I always say to Linda, is it this week? Remember, remember your brothers and sisters. You're not giving it to strangers. You're not giving it to the missionary so he can get rich. If you remember Sister Esther, Manny's wife, she is a uh, daughter of a missionary, and she tells the story of not having a roof over their head, that they were sleeping on the wooden pews in the old country, and they had no food, and they were dependent on the church that sent them there, and it was... They, as children, they were laying, sleeping on the benches because they didn't have beds, and they were thinking and feeling like they were forgotten. But they were still doing the work that God called them to do. So when you give to missions, don't look at the missionaries when they come here and they're all dressed up nice, and they, but think of them in those countries where they could be killed at any moment or their children are in those conditions in the poor country they're not here all the time, you know, when we see, like we see them. So just please step out of yourself. You know that whole God use me? He wants to use you. He wants to use you for missions, for people, brothers and sisters you can't see. And he wants to spread the gospel. Each and every one of us has the power to do that. Thank you. Share these with the kids, and then I'll leave them on the back. If anybody wants to take them, read them, put them back. Amen.
Praise the Lord. Well, since we don't have much time, we only got about 30 minutes, so we'll just let the kids stay with us. Is that all right? Can we do that? Praise God. Hmm. Monday night, if you were not here, Monday night, God moved. And... I said before that revival doesn't start in a nation. Revival doesn't start in a church. Revival starts in a person. It starts in us. And that's when we see a real genuine revival break forth. And and I believe God wants to do that. God has a remnant of people that he wants to move through, live through, and bring his presence back into the church again. <clears throat> you know, we get spoiled here. Um, if you've visited any churches lately, if you visit some of the churches, and I'm not knocking them down or anything like that, but you go to some of these churches and there's something missing. And it's not my personality and it's not me, but it's the move of the Holy Spirit. And we have to get that back. I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you this morning. Uh, We want to pray for uh, George. His mom is in the hospital, been there the last nine days. She's coughing up some blood. So if we could take a moment just now to pray for her and pray for Latia. She's not feeling well this morning. That's why they're not here today. And uh, let's just pray for Auntie Edith. I know she was a little tired this morning. Brenda's having a pain in her head. Let's pray for Brenda also, okay? In the name of Jesus. Father, we just pray for Brenda right now, Lord, for that pain in the head. Father, I pray, God, that you will open up your windows of heaven and pour out a healing touch for her right now. Father, I pray, Lord, that she'll take authority over the enemy and bind the enemy's powers through the blood of Jesus. And we we pray for healing in her life, in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we just pray for... Latia, Lord, for a touch on her. She's not feeling well today. God, I pray your Holy Spirit will touch her, minister to her, and bring her through this. And Father, for uh, George's mom who's in the hospital, we pray for her, her, Lord, right now for a divine touch by your Holy Ghost. Right now, send the Holy Spirit to her, Lord, and touch her right where she's at and heal that that bleeding, Father, that's going on, that you know where where it's from. We ask you to touch her right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. I want to share with you this morning, as he puts my slide up today. No, that's not the one. should be right there in the playlist. It was was right at the top. The, The songs you just played, it should be right at the top. I put it there. Unless you erased everything when you... It should be there. I I put it there. It should be there. Well, the devil's slick, isn't he? Always trying to mess with our... It should be on the desktop. It should, it should be there. There's one for the, for the scriptures, and then there's one to video. Go to video. It should be there. Where you played all the songs, it should be there. You're not going to find it. Who wants to testify while I go up there? You have something you want to share. Go ahead. I know you do. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Um, I do, actually. <laughs> uh, this morning, I have testimony because I had told Bobby, I said, I don't want church to be just a thing you do every Sunday, and it's just ritual-like, and you just do it, and then just 
go on your way. And I said, I want God to show up. <laughs> and when um, we were singing the songs, and a lot of them were like, breathe on me, change me, you know, and I was just like, Lord, I, I felt like I was fighting, like I couldn't press in. And I was like, help me, Lord, to enter in. And then as the songs went on, I did, and I started thanking God and you know, minister, he was ministering to me, and I was worshiping him. And then when um, I just, he spoke to me about how the very breath that we have in us is from him, and that it was it was so humbling. Like, I, I was like, oh, God, if I didn't even have that breath, I wouldn't even be here. <laughs> so right there is when it, I just was, that, that it right there, exalt God, because without his breath, we wouldn't even be alive. Okay. I want you to see the graphic, that's why. Okay, go ahead, put it up there. The message is, what will it take? You see the dead bones or the dry bones? And they're in a valley between a mountain. What will it take for God to move on you? What's it going to take? And what will you have to go through if you can turn this mic down just a little bit, it's a little too, too uh, bouncy for me. What will you have to go through in order for God to do something in your life? See, it's, it's different for the world because the world lives outside of the realm or outside of the atmosphere of God's presence. Now, they all go to church, some of them, you know, they go to church and everything, but they go out and they come in the same, they go in the same, they come out the same. But when you're a Christian, what are you going to have to go through? Because how many know God loves you? And he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Ezekiel 37. And now you can use the, uh, just go to the scripture one. There you go. I'm going to start at verse 1. Father, we pray for your moving of your spirit. We pray, God, that in this service you'll have your way. Speak to the hearts of people, not only here in this assembly, but, Father, all the way across in India, all the way across in Maine, Father, Wherever someone is watching this, this broadcast, I pray, Father, that you will touch them and let your word bring breath to them and, and, and life to them in Jesus' name. I want to say one more thing about Monday night. When uh, Brother Tim Trafford was with us, and we were here early before people started coming in, he said he had been in a place where God spoke a word, a rhema word, a living word to him, and it was about breathing on him. And we begin to sing that song, Breathe on Me. It's an old, old song, Breathe on Me. Let the breath of God now breathe on me. And we just kept singing that and singing it, and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost moved. And the Lord's been putting it on my heart. What we need to revive the church and to revive our lives is the breath of God. And that's why you heard a lot of songs this morning about breathe on me, breathing, and all that stuff. Because God wants to breathe upon us. Something happens when God's breath touches something. Amen? So it says here in uh, the, uh, Ezekiel 37, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me. That's divine favor. Okay, that wasn't for judgment. That was divine favor. 
the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. And he set me down in the midst of a valley which was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there was very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. Can I tell you right now that I believe that God is showing me that the valley of dry bones is many churches today. People are coming in and they're, they're, they're enjoying what God has for them. Then they're going home and living like the devil. They're going home living like the world. Going home not caring about the things of God or the church of God. They come to church when they feel like it. Come on, somebody. And they're full of dead men's bones. You say, well, how important is the breath of God? Well, you would not be breathing this morning if it wasn't for the breath of God. In Genesis chapter 2, it says this in verse 7. Maybe you can put that up real quick for me. As, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's pretty dry, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know about you, but when you get dust in your throat, it makes you cough. It's a real dryness to it. And when I one time was going through the Arizona desert, I was driving through the Arizona desert, and it was so dry. And, you know, you, you needed to have water. You needed to drink. And man was dry from the very creation It says, but God created him from the ground. And then he did this, what? He breathed into his nostrils the what? The breath of life. Hallelujah. How many know that he's talking about the natural life here? But I want you to know that spiritually there's a breath of life that you and I can partake of and I think, Rebecca, you had a little bit of it up here. Of that life that comes into you, that breath that comes into you, that breathes a newness of relationship, a newness of getting into the presence of God, experiencing Him and knowing Him. And that's why on Monday nights we're coming together not so much to ask for things, not to, so much to ask for God to do this or do that, but we're coming in Monday nights just to seek Him. Just Him. Him alone, saying, God, I want you in my life. I want you more. Breathe on me. Breathe in me, Lord. Breathe your breath of life spiritually and bring those things that are dead in my life to be alive again. And it says, and he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? Can these bones live? Go back to Ezekiel, please. Can these bones live? Thirty-seven, verse three. Can these bones live? Is it too far for the church? Have, have, has the church gone so far down and so dead today? Has it gone so far that there will be no more breath? It's, it's beyond resuscitation. It's beyond being able to be brought back to life. Just like the Lord said to Ezekiel. Can these bones live? And he answered him and he said. Oh Lord you only know God. Only you know. Only you know. 
whether these bones can live. It looks hopeless. There is prophecy in the word that says that things will wax worse and worse. That there's going to be a counterfeit church in the last days. We understand that. But I'm not talking about the counterfeit church. I'm talking about the church that has gone to sleep. We're to God, let the church die. There'd be nothing to compare it with. The world will continue to get worse and worse. People are getting worse and worse. I have the, sometimes the police officers that I talk to, they say they can't believe how things are getting worse and worse. And you can't go anywhere without something happening. But in the church, the church shouldn't be a place where it's dead. It should be a place where there's life and that living water is flowing, is bubbling up inside of us and it should be coming out and springing forth. When we sang that song, Waymaker, I don't know if you noticed, but in the middle of that song, there was a scripture. Do you know what that scripture was? It was Isaiah 44, verse 3, what we have right on the back wall there. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offspring. That's a promise of God. God is not going to let his church totally die. There's always going to be a remnant. There's always going to be those who are going to seek after God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their mind. And the thing about it is that people will make fun of you. They'll laugh at you. They'll ridicule you. They'll tell you you're getting too fanatical and all of these things. But don't let that stop you from pressing in and pressing through to the things of God. If they want to be dead like my wife said, God spoke to her and said, let the dead bury the dead. You cannot resurrect the dead if they don't want and they don't believe in it. Let them be dead. But there's something that God was telling to Ezekiel. He said, now understand what, what he gave Ezekiel was a vision. He didn't go to a literal graveyard and there were bones all over the place. He says, I was, I was taken up by the Spirit of the Lord, and he showed me this valley. But there was something God wanted to do in this portion of Scripture to these dead bones. And I'll say that to the church. A lot of the churches today, not all of them, thank God, there's remnants out there. Where God is getting and arresting the hearts of the people. He's calling them back to biblical Christianity. He's calling them back to have the mindset of a real Christian and not a carnal Christian. And God is here instructing Ezekiel. And he tells him, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's re, uh, reply to him was, God, I, I don't know if they can be resurrected. I don't know if they can live again. I, I don't have that power and the capacity in and of myself to know that. What does that tell you and I? That tells you that when God is moving in the miraculous, when God wants to move in the supernatural, sometimes we're not going to understand or have the ability to do it. So God tells Ezekiel in verse 4, He gives them what He needs to do. He said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones. What is prophecy? Speaking forth what God says. Hallelujah. You have some dry bones in your closet. You have some dry bones in your family. 
You have some dry bones in situations. You have some dry bones in your finances. You need to prophesy over them. You need to speak to them the word of God. I'm not talking about some fanciful idea, you know, idea or ideology that you come up with. I'm not talking about some kind of formula you fall you follow. I'm talking about speaking the word of God, which is quick and powerful. It's alive. It's real. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And we don't use the word. We try to fight the enemy with our words. God told Ezekiel, he said, you need, hallelujah, you need to prophesy upon these bones and you say to them, he even gives you the very thing to say. Oh, you dry bones, hear my words as I come to you. No. Don't speak your words. Hear the word of the Lord. Can I tell you, did you catch it Monday night, the word of the Lord? Was breathe on me, God. And when we began to do that, what happened? When God gave that word, people started coming to the altars, falling on their face, worshiping God, seeking God for him, not for anything else. But just for him. Just for him. Breathe on me. You understand what that means? When you ask God to breathe on you, he's going to breathe on you his breath of life spiritually. You're already breathing now. Hopefully some of you are breathing. I hope, hope no one here is not breathing this morning. Hallelujah. We have to get one of them AED machines just in case so we can. I'm trained in that. I can do that. <laughs> Hallelujah. I can do CPR, so I'll have somebody do the breathing part, and I can do the pumping part. <laughs> he said, listen to the word that the Lord has. Verse 5. Thus saith God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter. Wait a minute. Oh, oh. Enter into you? They're just a bunch of bones. They're just a bunch of bones. What does that mean? There's no flesh. There's no sinew on them. There's, there's no, no muscle, no tendons, nothing. How are you going to breathe on bones? He said, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Hallelujah. Can I tell you, there's coming... We understand there's coming the Antichrist. We understand there's coming the mark of the beast. We understand all that evil's coming and things are getting worse and worse. The Bible predicts that it's all going to happen. But in the meantime, there's a remnant of God's people that God is going to breathe into them and they're going to come alive again. They're in some of these churches. They're in some of these dead churches and they're saying, God, I need more. I need more. I need more. I need more. And they're coming. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. They're coming. Remember, it was prophesied over our church that they would be coming from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Can I tell you, they're coming from the north. Yes, from the Boston area. Someone's coming all the way from Boston because they've experienced something here Monday. And they said, I'm coming back. And not only that, but they're going to go pick up their mom and go all the way back to Boston, they're going to Bridgewater, go all the way back to Boston, and coming back. Can you see the hunger? Not for me, not for For His Glory Christian Assembly, but for God Himself, because He's breathing on him, on people. He's breathing. He is the breath of life is coming upon them. Oh, Rabba Shakaraba. Let me tell you, if you want the breath of life, God will give it to you. But he's saying to Ezekiel, I'm going to breathe and to enter you and you shall live. But they're just bones. He said, prophesy to the bones. Then he said, 
verse 6. And I will lay sinew upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. There's a process. He's going to deal with your flesh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's going to make it so that you're in a position to want more and more and more of God. Now, I heard somebody say this to me the other day. God does, we don't need more of God. God needs more of us. But no, 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 no. It starts with you. See, the word doesn't say God will draw an eye to you and then you draw an eye to him. Does it say that? No. It says you draw an eye to God. God will draw an eye to you. It starts with you. The desire has to start with you. Your will that God gave you, the free will that you have, it takes you to choose. You to choose. And so you can have more of God. You've got to desire that. Blessed are the hungry, for they shall be fed. Blessed are the thirsty, for they shall drink. You have to, you have to make the initiative. If you think for one moment you're going to sit back and God's going to do everything, you're mistaken. It'll never happen to you. And can I, I'll even prophesy that over you. It'll never happen over you. You have to press in. You have to desire. You have to go with. You have to enter in. It wasn't, see, the priest couldn't get hope, get, get clean unless he entered in. He couldn't get clean unless he entered in. He couldn't go into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies, unless he entered in. You must enter in. You must go with what God has been speaking and been prophesying. I'm telling you, I, I've been waking up in the morning. I've been singing. I've been going to the shower and just weeping and, and weeping in the shower and crying out to God. And, and I just feel his presence, even in the shower. Hallelujah. I'm thinking about starting a, a television program, Shower of Power. It seems like every time I'm, I'm in the shower, God's spirit shows up. Don't worry, I won't be starting a shower, church. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> he said, you're going to live and you shall know that I am the Lord. It, it, the church needs to get that back again, knowing that he's God. Knowing that he's the Lord. We've lost the fear of God. That's part of bringing the life back into the church. In verse 4, he says again, prophesy unto these bones. Look at verse 7. So I said to myself, well, I don't really need to do that. God's sovereign. He can move by himself. He doesn't need me. He's God all by himself. I can just, I don't have to do, I don't have to prophesy. God will just take care of everything. Is that what he did? No, he says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. God didn't tell him to, see, God didn't tell him to prophesy and it was a suggestion. God didn't suggest to Ezekiel that he prophesy. He commanded him. He said, if you want to see life in these bones, come on, somebody. He said, if you want to see life in these bones, he says, you need to prophesy to them. If you want to see your auntie and your uncle and your cousins and your nephews and your nieces and your sisters and your brothers and your mama and your papa come to Jesus, you need to prophesy to them, them dead bones. The devil's had them long enough. It's time for you and I to stand up and begin to speak the word of God. Hallelujah. You say, yeah, but pastor, they have a will of their own. They, are, they do, but prophesy misery on them. Say, God, make it so miserable in their life that they'll ask, what can I do to get out of this? What do I, what's wrong? What's happening in my life? Uh, there's something wrong. There's, I, I, I have a desire, but I don't know what it's for. And then you can step in and say, let me tell you, it's for Jesus. Hallelujah. Prophesy to them dead bones. 
He says, and as he said, I prophesied as I commanded. Watch this now. And as I prophesied. Can I tell you, some of you have a gift of prophecy, you know. Stop going back and forth in your mind. Is it God? Is it not God? Is it God? Just do it! You're robbing people of a blessing. Can I tell you, you may hold the key to revival. Oh, I, oh, pastor, oh, I felt like dancing in the spirit. Well, dance! You may have the key that unlocks the movement of God. Begin to dance in the aisle. That's old time Pentecost. I'm not talking about this choreographed stuff. I'm talking about getting an unction from the Holy Ghost and getting up and dancing in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Woo, glory. He says, and as I prophesied, <laughs> I don't know if I should do this, Lord. I don't think, I don't know if anything's going to happen. God, these are dead bones. I mean, come on, they're dead bones. There's no life, there's no sinew, there's no flesh, there's nothing in them, there's nothing. Just bones. What's going to happen? People think I'm crazy. What if nothing happens? See, we talk ourselves out of obedience. What are people going to say? What if nothing happens? Did God command you? Yes, do it. The results are his. Hallelujah. He says, so as I prophesied, yeah, he said, there was a noise. Something began to happen. Are you hearing me? Something began to happen. Now, you may not see it right away. But when you prophesy, something begins to happen. There was a noise. And behold, something else took place. Come on. There was a shaking. I think it was Jerry Lee Lewis that said there's a whole lot of shaking going on. Hallelujah. And that was in the flesh, but I want you to know there's going to be a whole lot of shaking when you begin to prophesy. Come on, come on. Hallelujah. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit in Corinthians. Prophesy. So, when, so I prophesied as, as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. Can I tell you right now, I'm going to prophesy right now, and I'm going to tell you that God is going to begin to shake his church. Hallelujah. He's beginning right here. Hallelujah. He's beginning right now. And he's going to be shaking you. And you better be ready. Because he's either going to shake you to the place of obedience. Or you'll be shaken and you'll run back to Egypt. Hallelujah. You won't be able to stand being in the presence of God. And it's funny, when I see that, when I, when I play music or I see something going on, and I see people leave, I say, uh-oh, they can't be in the prophetic. They get uncomfortable, you know. They got to leave. They get up and leave. I say, uh-oh, something ain't right. You know why? Because when God begins to move, God begins to speak. Someone was telling me the other day, I forget who it was, they said, do you know you prophesied this over me years ago? I don't even remember. But it's true. God will give you things to prophesy over. And you speak them. And, 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 and it's going to cause a shaking. Hallelujah. I mean, how many went through something just because of Monday? Yeah. 
some real difficult thing, some real demonic manifestation. Because of what happened here Monday night. The devil is not going to sit back and let you get close to Jesus. He's going to tell you, be religious. Just go to church. Just, you know, just, just fit in, you know. No, God don't want you to fit in. You have gifts and talents that God has given you for this body, and he wants to use you. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's a shaking going on. And then something happened. What does it say? The bones came together. Wait a minute. Can I tell you, you don't need no super glue. You don't need no gorilla glue. Come on. You can't make it happen on your own. You can't get there and stop saying, okay, the hip bone's connected to the thigh bone. and the th You can't do that. Hallelujah. You've got to just let God put the bones together. That's God's business. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All you need to do is prophesy whatever God says to you. He said, but the bones, they came together. Bone to his bone. Hallelujah. Verse 8. Hallelujah. Come on. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above. Okay. They had all the flesh now, everything. They looked like humans, right? Can I tell you, that's what is happening in the church. Got a lot of sinew and flesh sitting there, and they're just sitting in church and just, you know, enjoying things and just getting... But they got no breath in them. They have no life in them. If you're a Christian, you ain't desiring the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Something wrong with you. Because the Spirit of God searches the deep things of God. If you want to get deeper with God, you need the Holy Ghost. I don't believe, the Bi I don't believe that God put in the Bible uh, an option for the Holy Spirit baptism. I believe God put it in the Bible for us that it's a necessity to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And if you are not baptized in the Holy Ghost, maybe because you need to have the breath of God breathe on you. Come on. Praise God. Look what it says. But there was no breath in them. There was no breath in them. No breath at all. Wait a minute. There was no breath in them. So you think he was done with his, his work? God doesn't want you just being operating in the flesh. He wants you to be operating in the spirit. So he needed to breathe on them. Verse 9, watch this now. Come on. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. What? You want me to prophesy to the wind? What's the wind got to do with anything? The wind is the wind. It comes from the north, the south, the east. We don't know where it comes from, but you know. But we know where it goes. We see the trees. And then we see, oh, it's blowing that way. But you want me to prophesy to the wind? Do you know that God uses the wind? The Bible says that when they were all in one accord, there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. Glory to God. Hallelujah. There was a sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it fell upon all of them, and they all began to speak in tongues as God gave the utterance. Don't you listen to the devil tell you that tongues ain't for today, that it's not for an expression in the church today. That's the devil, and they're lying to you. And it's not an option. It's not if you believe it or not. It's, it's a necessity to be functioning and growing 
in the way that God wants you to grow. And to be able to fight the devil. Come on. He said, prophesy to the wind. I'm running over a little bit. Can I just go a little bit more? I know, I know, I know, I know. Don't, don't get into the religion of church, you know. An hour and a half, you know, an hour, you know. Don't get into that. Let God move. Just relax, sit back, breathe. <sighs> breathe it all in. He said, <laughs> he said to me, prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. And that's what you need to do. You need to prophesy, Holy Ghost, wind of God, come upon my, my son. Come upon my little boy. Come upon my daughters. Come upon my husband. Come upon my kids. Come upon my sister. Come upon my, my nephew, my nieces, and my and my, my, uh, my uh, other nieces and cousins. God, come upon them. Breathe from your four winds, O oh God. Oh, Rabababo Shakama. Ah, hallelujah. Breathe and breathe upon these slain, those that are dead, those that are walking around, dead men walking. Breathe on them, Lord. For what purpose? That they may live. Whew. Glory to God. That they may live. Next verse. So I prophesied again as, I, as he commanded me. And what happened? What happened? Breath came into them. Do you see the prophetic works when you speak the word of the Lord? Not your prophecies, but the word of the Lord. When you speak that, come on, somebody. When God tell, gives you a word and you speak that over your family, you speak that over your situation, you speak that over your finances, let me tell you, it begins to move things in your life. And then it says, and they lived and stood upon their feet in exceeding great army. Hallelujah. What is it about an army? Think about that a moment. They become a great army. Now, some of you were in the army, right? I know Rebecca and Bobby were for a short time. They were in the army. When they gave you a command to do something, did you say, well, whether I feel like it or not, I'm not going to do it, I'm, I just don't want to do it? No. When God breathes upon you and you have life, it's not about what you want to do, what you choose or choose not to do. You're in the army of the Lord, and you have a commander-in-chief, and that commander-in-chief is Requiring obedience. God's going to restore the church. He's going to judge the church because judgment begins in the house of God. And he's judging it. And I believe this message is going to start something. And he's judging the deadness of it. Come on, somebody. Look at the Gospel of John for one moment. The last chapter of the Gospel of John. I'm sorry, the 20th chapter. Verse 21. Chapter 20, verse 21. It says, Then Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you. My Father has sent me, even so I send you. Next verse, please. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now some people say, see now? See, they had the Holy Ghost, see? No, that we receive is in the future. It's a future tense. 
But what did he do? Huh? No, it says he breathed on them. He breathed on them. Jesus breathed on them, gave them spiritual life and hope of a promise. Of a promise in the future. Come on, somebody. Grab a hold of this. And you know when that promise came? Acts 1.8. When they received the Holy Ghost, it came as a rushing mighty wind. Why did it come as a rushing mighty wind? Because of the breath. What did God tell us Monday night? Breathe on me. Ask me to breathe on you. And when we did, what happened? He did. And he breathed, and that, that breath of life came into us, man. I'm telling you, it will change you. It w I'm telling you. Why? Because it's God himself. It's not something you're seeking after apart from God. The very breath of God is him. And the more you seek after him, the more you seek for him on Monday night, come out, please. Make no excuse. Come out if you can. I understand sometimes you're, maybe you're elderly, you can't get here. That's fine. But be here. Don't let anything distract you. Be on the edge of your seat waiting to hear the next thing. Come on. Excited to be in God's house. David didn't say, I was sad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. He said, I was glad. Are you glad when you get in your car? Are you glad when you get up? Are you glad when you're all dinky-eyed and your hair's all messed up in the morning and you get up, you look in the mirror and go, oh God, I can't go to church today. No, or do you just wash your face and take your shower, wash your face and you know, comb your hair and put your clothes on and you get in the car and you can't wait to get here. Why? Not because it's here, but because God's Spirit is here. He wants to breathe some life into you. And I hope this message this morning breathes some life into you. In Revelation chapter 3, I kind of lied a little bit. I said that would be the last scripture. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I, that was called a hyperbole. That was a, a lie without... No deception. No intention of deception. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These, say, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. There was a church that had a name that they were living, but they are dead. Just put two and two together about our area. That's all I'll say about that. They have a name that they are alive, but really they're dead. Something missing. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you got something missing, you're dead. Deader than a doornail. You're dead, 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 dead. Verse 14 and 17. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith, Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creator of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I word that you were either cold or hot, so because you are neither lukewarm, uh, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. No life. They ought to have a church like that in this area. No life. No life church. All the dead people, all the, all the carnal people, and all the people that uh, want to bring in all kinds of uh, superstition and religion and and homosexuality and lesbianism and lesbian pastors and all this that should be the that should be the call that should be called that church no life they can have all of the outward appearance of life but guess what they don't have life 
You say, man, don't you know you can get in trouble for saying that? No, I, have a, I, have a, I am a citizen of the United States of America, and I have the right to free speech. I'm not hurting any particular person. I'm not aiming it at one particular person. I'm, t I'm aiming it at a movement. And I'm not afraid anyway. If I go to jail, I'll have a jail ministry. God will open up that prison door if he wants me out of there, just like he did for Peter. Come on, somebody. He said, breathe. Breathe. Breathe on me. So God says, prophesy to the wind. Can I say he said prophesy to the dead bones? And he did. But there was two parts to that. He had to prophesy to the wind also. Sometimes God will have you do something and then you think it's all done. And God says, no, you're not done yet. You need to do this. So do you want the breath of God on you this morning? Do you want to breathe life? Do you want to be a, a person that attracts people? You know, life begets life. If you're alive and, you know, don't be like some of these people in some churches. You walk in the door and they have a greeter. And this is what the greeter looks like. Hi. Welcome to our church. I'm glad you're here. Hope you have a good time. Well, it doesn't look like you're having a good time. I'm not talking about acting out. I'm not talking about putting on. No. But let something spring out of you. Let something come out of you. Hey, nice to see you. I love you. Glad you're with us this morning. Invite somebody to church. Won't go to church. I ain't going to want to go to church. I want to go to church. I have to go to church Sunday. You want to come with me? <laughs> Who, wants to go to <laughs> Who wants to go to church with you? Hey, but let me tell you about church. I'm going to church Sunday. I can't wait for God to speak to me. I want you to know that God will speak to you. Would you like to come? I think, I think I'd want to go, wouldn't you? Prophesy to the bones. Prophesy to the wind. Don't give in to the lies of the devil. Don't, don't, I know he's already whispering in your ear, oh, don't do nothing with this message. It's, you know, it's just another sermon, pastor's preaching, and it's a nice sermon, it's all nice and everything. No, don't, you don't have to do it. No, don't listen to that devil. Ask the Lord, say, God, it's only going to happen, too. Can I tell you this? It's only going to happen right here. It ain't going to happen over there sitting in the chair. You see, that's a missing element in the church today is the altar. Today we got Christian psychologists making appointments. There's nothing wrong with that. You want to make an appointment, go ahead. Christian counselors, go ahead. Can I tell you, there have been times you go at the altar and God will solve your problems right there. Oh, I need deliverance. I need to go to a deliverance ministry. No, you don't. You need to go right to the altar. Yeah, he did it for Rebecca. He did it for your friend Monday night. No, Sunday. Sunday, when I just asked her for an altar call, she came up, and boy, and God touched her. Ooh-wee. We need to get back to the altar. Can we do that? Can we get back to the altar? Amen? Can we, can we play, put where the altar was? See, the altar was where they had sacrifice. When they had sacrifice and they poured the blood on the altar, God showed up. Now, I know all you theologians out there are going to say, yeah, but the altar of God is our hearts now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 